So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're talking about a case from Australia, kind well, yeah, it is from Australia, but also kind of America. Mm. It'll make more sense as we go. So this case is known by many different names. It's known as the Brownout Murders, the Brownout Strangler, the Of Mice and Men Killer, the Singing Strangler, the Smiling Strangler. I'm sure you can guess what this serial killer did. Oh, it's a serial killer as well, by the way. I feel like this intro is a little bit of a mess, just like me. Also, I do just want to give you a little bit of a warning. This is a wartime case and um, yours truly does not know a single thing about any of the wars, which is probably a big flaw in my character. I was not good at history in school. Obviously, I was the true crime girl that was too busy watching all the documentaries. <laughs> so if I'm not saying things correctly or if I'm getting my facts slightly wrong about the war, I have tried my best, obviously, but that'll be why. <laughs> I was not the sharpest tool in the history class. So like I said, today we're gonna be talking about the Brownout murders and this is one hell of a case. This is a long, long case. And so for that reason, you already know what's coming. Well, maybe you don't. This is actually gonna be a three-parter. Not a two-parter, a three-parter. So, this is part one. Part two will be out in the next few days and then part three will follow very quickly after that because you guys know I'm getting good at this now, aren't I? Make sure you're subscribed with notifications on so you don't miss when the rest of this series comes out. All of that being said, before we jump into this case, I just wanna thank our sponsor for making this video possible, Wild. Wild is a sustainable, zero plastic, natural deodorant company. Their stuff is made from plants. It's packaged in plants. How it works is you basically get your aluminium case and this is a case that you'll keep forever. I chose the coral one and I even got my name engraved on the top. How cute. And then you get these deodorant refills which come in so many gorgeous gorgeous scents but my favourite scent so far is mint and eucalyptus. It's what I've got in here right now and it's just so fresh and clean. Honourable mention though to coconut dreams. It's perfect for summer. I can just imagine taking that one on holiday and like you put your deodorant on and then you walk on the beach and you can smell the coconut someone live my fantasy for me, I beg. So basically what you do is you take off the bottom part of the case, you hold down the buttons, pull the bottom out, and then you pop your refill in, send it back up there, and then twist and you've got your deodorant. When you're done with it, you just take the refill out and you can throw it in the compost because it's completely recyclable. And then you just pop your new refill in and it's that easy. You're saving so much plastic, so many materials, as opposed to just buying a brand new deodorant every time and then just throwing the can out. Their packaging and the refills are 100% recyclable, like I said, and their deodorants themselves are aluminium, sulfate, and paraben free, which is amazing. It doesn't leave white streaks, it doesn't stain your clothes, and because it's not actually an antiperspirant, that means that it doesn't block the pores under your arms, because let's be honest, who actually wants that? It allows you to sweat naturally, as a human body should do, but it helps to sort out the smell that comes with that sometimes. And one of the things I love about Wild is that you can just buy a one-off deodorant if you want, or you can get a flexible subscription, which makes life so much easier. You don't have to worry about stocking up on your deodorant or getting low on it because you'll literally just get one shipped out to your house. Perfect. So if you wanna try out Wild deodorants, you can click the link down below in the description and use the code NEIL at checkout to get 20% off of your first order. You are so welcome. Thanks again to Wild for sponsoring this video. Now, before we get into it, I just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I'm in absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this case. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. Well, three videos. Videos. Just a couple of content warnings before we get into this. These content warnings are not specifically for this episode, but for the case in whole. Just because I don't want you to get too into the case in part one and then a theme in part two trips you up and you don't want to watch it. So the themes that I'm about to say, they might not pop up in this video, but they will at some point during the three parts. So these are themes of sexual assault, rape, alcoholism, abuse, domestic abuse, um, child abuse. So if you don't wanna watch any of that, feel free to click out of this video now. I'm sure I'll see you again at some point with a case that's a little bit more suitable for you, but look after yourself in the meantime. All of that being said, 
This has been a long intro. Let's get into the case. So this one takes place in Melbourne, Australia in the 1940s, which is around the time of World War II, like right in the middle of World War II. So just for a little bit more context throughout this case, let's talk about what Melbourne was like during the war. So Australia enlisted the help of the US because they were allies. And so America sent over 250,000 GIs to be stationed over in three cities in Australia, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney. That's 250,000 GIs that were stationed in those cities, but there were way more that just passed through Australia at some point and did bits here and there. And that number is believed to be over a million over a million. America was going in to help Australia. It was so much that almost 5% of Australia's population was believed to be American soldiers during World War II. I don't think it was a full 5%, I think it was more like the low fours or the high threes, but still that's crazy. And so as I'm sure you can imagine, this shook up life in Australia quite a bit. I mean, they have hundreds of thousands of men from a different country, a different culture, a different background coming in and, and sharing their space. So a lot of things changed. Alcoholism was already a little bit of a problem in Australia as far as I'm aware, but the Americans coming over accelerated it through the roof. Alcoholism was a huge, huge problem in World War II. And that's not even specific to Australia or the American soldiers, it was just ev everyone. But because we're talking specifically about Australia, let's talk about the side effects side effects of this alcoholism in the country. There were a lot more road accidents from people drinking and driving. Crime rates went up, you know, just general bad behavior in the country brought on by excessive drinking. This isn't related to the alcoholism thing, but this is another thing that changed in Australia. And that was that the Australian women were rather attracted to these new American men. And this pissed off the Australian men at the time because a lot of Australian men, with it being the war, they were sent off to fight elsewhere. And so the Australian men are looking back at their country thinking, wow, those Americans have come to our country, they're living at large, stealing all our women, drinking all our drinks. Meanwhile, we're busting our bums out here on the front lines. I think there was already quite a big divide between Australian men, Australian soldiers and the American ones. And this, all the women being attracted to the American men, I think this only widened the gap. These, these two groups of men did not like each other. It was a known fact that these American soldiers were getting paid more for doing less than the Australian soldiers were. And even just like down to their uniforms, the American men just had nicer and better quality uniforms than the Australians and the Australian women liked those uniforms. And what didn't help this divide at all were the bars and pubs. Like I said, alcoholism, huge, huge issue, mainly among soldiers. And these bars and pubs in Australia would say to Australian men that were coming up trying to order a drink, they'd say, oh no, sorry, we're out of that, or we've just run out of this drink, or we don't have any of that in. When really, they did have it, but they were saving it for the American men who were bigger spenders. And these bars and pubs knew that they could charge the American men more for the same drink that they would have served to the Australian man because he knows the prices in his own country, but the American men didn't. Australian men just felt like they were being done dirty. Like, especially the ones that were still in their country, they were fuming. They were watching the Americans live a better life than they were in their own country. So there was tension among a lot of the men in Australia at the time, and then there were the brownouts. Brownouts and blackouts were a huge, huge thing for so many countries throughout so many different wars, but primarily the world wars. Over here in the UK, it's what's referred to as a blackout, and so many different countries have their own version of a blackout or a brownout. And this is where the whole country would turn out pretty much all the lights in the whole country. So that's the lights in your houses, street lights outside, shop signs, car lights, like your headlights, even the lights on the front of trains and stuff. No one was allowed any light on really for a period of time. And they would do this when enemy aircrafts were flying above the country so that these enemies couldn't see where they were trying to bomb in the country. Because obviously they'll try to go for the big places like London or big transport links or 
ports or things like that so that they can cause the most devastation to the country. Whereas if we switch all the lights off, how are they gonna know where London is? You know what I mean? So we would like turn out all the lights so that enemies don't know where they're bombing. And Australia would do kind of the same thing, but a little bit less intense than the UK. So they would have what is known as a brownout rather than a blackout. So while we would like switch off every single light that we could and like black out the curtains and stuff, they instead would just dim the lights. So the street lights were just dimmed or they would have like every other street light on or I read in some sources that they would actually take the bulb out of the street light and then they would paint most of it like a black paint to block out a lot of it and they would just leave like a tiny bit on the bottom to shine down onto the road and then they'd put it back in so it wasn't causing as much light. They would put covers over car headlights and train headlights and stuff so that they could still see and they could still use their lights but it wasn't as bright and as I'm sure you can imagine this came with a lot of issues, a lot of car crashes, a lot of road accidents, along with the alcoholism and now you also can't see where you're even driving there was a lot of issues. I mean, the country did end up lowering the speed limit through the brownouts so that this kind of thing wouldn't happen, but did it work? No. So anyway, that's the kind of environment that we're talking about during World War II. There was a lot of chaos, a lot of just new and different things happening. Everyone was just kind of thrown off at the time if that even makes sense. I'm sure you can imagine how that would feel though. Things didn't feel normal for anyone and so anything went really. People were doing weird stuff and people were like, okay, it's the war. That really doesn't make any sense. I'm sure it will to some people. On May 3rd, 1942 is when this case began. The country was in the middle of another one of their brownouts when police received a phone call from a man believing that he had just stumbled across a dead body. So police rushed down to the scene at Albert Park and there they found the half-naked dead body of a woman laying in the alcove doorway of a shop. So this was relatively out in the open in the doorway of a shop, but due to the fact that it was in the middle of a brownout and also it was kind of tucked away inside the alcove, that meant that the murder was hidden quite well. The victim had blood all over the back of her head, she had marks around her neck as though she'd been strangled. Her clothing had just been ripped to shreds. The top part of her dress, she was wearing a dress, the top part had been pulled down to expose her breasts. The bottom had been pretty much entirely ripped off and her legs were bent up and spread apart, exposing her genitals. So immediately this suggested a sexual element to this crime. So her body was taken for autopsy and identification where they found that this was the body of 39 year old Ivy Violet McLeod. It was determined that Ivy must have been murdered between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m that night and even though she had this huge wound to the back of her head and there was a lot of blood, it really didn't seem as though that was her cause of death. That was actually down to the marks on her neck. It seemed that Ivy had been strangled to death and this head injury must just have been part of the struggle, part of the ordeal. Although the hit to the back of her head was actually severe enough to fracture her skull. As for her other injuries, she was bruised like all over her body as though she'd been grabbed in certain places. Her face was bruised as well. But something interesting that was found in the autopsy was that even though, based on the way that her body was found, it seemed that sexual assault had been a part of this crime, but the autopsy didn't find any sign of any kind of sexual element to this attack. There wasn't kind of any physical sign of rape or penetration or sexual assault on Ivy's body. That doesn't mean that that wasn't the killer's motive. That doesn't mean that they didn't get some kind of sexual gratification from this, but the physical reports say that nothing actually happened to Ivy's body. So anyway, police are still at the crime scene and they very quickly noticed that Ivy's handbag was still next to her body. So they looked inside it, it still had a purse in, her ID, her keys, absolutely everything. Everything was still in this bag. So robbery was ruled out very quickly as a motive. So now the motive was quite unclear. I mean, robbery was ruled out, 
sexual assault was ruled out for the most part. Sexual gratification could still have been the motive, but I mean, it was quite confusing looking at this murder to wonder what the murderer actually got out of this. To be fair, maybe they had planned to sexually assault Ivy or rape her or something, but maybe they'd been disturbed in the process. Maybe they heard footsteps or maybe they got scared and just left. So the way that Ivy's body was actually found, like I said, it was a man that called the police. His name was Harold Gibson. He was an Australian man that worked at the bar across the street and the bar had just closed up and so Harold was out on the street having a cigarette. So he lit his cigarette and then he looked up and across the street, he noticed what he initially believed to be a mannequin laying in the shop doorway. So he decided to go over and take a look and because it was in the middle of the brownout, it was super, super dark. When he got over there, Harold actually had to light a match, kind of like to use it as a torch because he couldn't see anything. And when he lit that match, it illuminated this woman's body on the ground in front of him and that was when he realized that this wasn't a mannequin. But even though he knew it wasn't a mannequin, he still didn't quite realize that he was looking at a dead body just yet. I don't think he could see the blood or the injuries or anything. He actually now thought that this was just a drunk woman passed out in a shop doorway. Like I said, the country was in complete chaos. Everyone was drinking a lot to be able to cope with the war. So it was entirely possible that this was just a drunk woman. So Harold bent down and touched this woman's leg to try to maybe shake her and wake her up. But when his hand touched her leg, he realized that she was cold. So Harold ran back into the bar where he worked and he called the police from in there. And then as soon as he came off the phone to police, he was waiting for them to arrive. He remembered that the woman was actually half naked when he'd been over there. And so he went into the back of the pub and he got some bin liners and took them over to where Ivy's body was. And he just covered her up with these bin bags just to preserve her dignity. When police got there, they started asking Harold all these different questions. Did he see anything? Did he hear anything? And he said that he had actually seen a man walking away from that exact shop alcove literally just minutes before he went over and found the body. This had to have been the killer leaving the crime scene. No one else walked along that street between Harold seeing this guy leave and then going over and finding that woman's body. Obviously, because it was so dark at the time, please remember that this was dark because otherwise it sounds like quite an impossible story. The fact that he could see a man walking away, but he couldn't see this woman. You have to remember it was very, very dark. And because it was so dark, I feel like I'm gonna be saying the word dark so much in this video, but because it was so dark, um, Harold actually couldn't see this person's face, this man's face. So he couldn't describe him very very well to the police, but one thing he did notice about this man was that he was wearing an American soldier's uniform. He was an American GI. So Australian police decided that the best thing that they could do right now in the start of this investigation when they really had nothing to go on was to call the American military authorities and just inform them what had happened, what had been seen, and see if they could help. But of course, American military authorities didn't want to admit that one of the men that they had sent over, literally to protect Australia, had gone over there and killed someone instead. They sent a soldier over there and he killed someone that he was trying to protect. So these American military authority people were just trying to deflect the whole thing. They were saying, well, how did Harold see for sure that this was an American soldier? Surely it was dark. It was in the middle of a brownout. Is he sure it was an American soldier? But Harold was certain, like he saw what he saw. He knew he saw an American soldier that night, but the American authorities, they just didn't believe him and they dismissed it. And they were very uncooperative in general with the Australian police as they were trying to solve this case. I mean, there wasn't much that the American military authorities could do from all the way over there, but they could have been a little bit more helpful. And Australian police felt that this was the only chance that they had was to work with the American side and be able to identify and track this man down but now they were being ignored. They were gonna have to try and find this American soldier themselves, but this was gonna prove very hard for the police because as sad as this is, Australia in general had bigger things to worry about than the murder of one woman. It sounds awful, it really does. But remember the country is literally at war 
it's World War Two. They could be getting bombed at any second. Their loved ones could be dying over on the front lines. Like, there was a lot going on. There was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of news. And although Ivy's murder was big news, it wasn't quite front page news. The war was front page every day. And because her story was, it, she was kind of put on page four, five, six, not many people heard of it. So this meant that when police made appeals for any witnesses, anyone that might have known Ivy or anyone that might have seen her that day, it just fell on deaf ears. No one saw these appeals and so they really didn't have many people coming forward to help them in the investigation. And so the search for Ivy's killer was over before it had even really begun. I mean, police were gonna keep this case open, they were gonna keep trying, but there was nothing more to do. Police did go and speak with Ivy's friends and family and they actually found that the last person to have seen and spoke to her was a man that she was having an affair with behind her husband's back. His name was John Patrick Thompson. He was an aircraft mechanic. The two of them had met maybe six or seven months before Ivy's murder and John swore that he had no idea that Ivy was married because when she introduced herself to him, she introduced herself using her maiden name. She would take her ring off her finger whenever she was with him. Like he had no idea that this woman that he thought he was in a relationship with was also married. Thompson told the police that Ivy had promised him that the two of them were gonna run away together soon. They were gonna run off to New South Wales. They were gonna start a new life together as, as their own little family unit. And they were both super excited for it, but of course that never happened. So already this case is very messy. <laughs> police are trying to talk to everyone involved, but obviously there's a lot of tenseness and hostility because these two men have both just found out that the love of their life is actually with another person. And of course, in police's eyes, both of these men are suspects. Both of them are prime suspects because if, what if one of them found out about the other person and then they killed Ivy for cheating on them? So police decide to look into these two men a little bit more. John Thompson, who was Ivy's boyfriend and also her husband who I don't actually know his name. Mr. McLeod, we'll just call him Mr. McLeod. So John Thompson said that Ivy had been round at his place that night until around 2.15 in the morning when she actually left to go and catch her tram home. Thompson had offered to walk her all the way to the tram stop, but she said, no, 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 I'll be fine. I've done it plenty of times before. And so he just walked her to the end of his garden, said goodbye to her and she went off on her way. Thompson had mentioned to the police as he was telling this story that he actually lived opposite a pub and around the time that Ivy was leaving his house, it was closing time at that pub. So he just suggested to police that maybe they look into everyone that was there that night because maybe one of them saw Ivy leaving and then took that opportunity to go and approach her. But the police, I mean, given the context of Ivy's murder and what was going on in her life, they were interested in those men at the pub at closing time. They were interested in Mr. McLeod and Mr. Thompson. So they're doing all these interviews. Meanwhile, police back at the station actually had an unexpected visitor. A woman dropped into the police station to tell the police that she believes she spoke with Ivy McLeod's murderer on the night of Ivy's death. So this woman told the police that she had been making her journey home that night, just like Ivy had. Although this woman was doing it a little bit earlier in the evening when she was approached by an American soldier. This man approached her and he asked her out on a date then and there. Like he wanted to go out then and there. He was gonna take her for a drink. And obviously it was late and this woman was like, thanks, but no thanks. To which this American soldier replied, you're lucky, I was thinking of killing someone tonight. And as soon as police heard this witness statement from this woman, they pretty much stopped looking into the men in Ivy's life, so her husband and Patrick Thompson, no, John Patrick Thompson? Mr. Thompson, anyway. Um, because it seemed as though Ivy had been murdered by a stranger, by just some random American soldier. But that was about as far as police got in this investigation until they woke up one morning, six days after Ivy's murder, to the news of another body being found. It was another woman around Ivy's age. Her name was Pauline Thompson. She was 31 years old and she was also murdered 
during a brownout the night before. Her body was found laying on some concrete steps outside of a boarding house. She was actually found by the security guard that kind of patrols those areas on a night. And she was found in a very similar way to Ivy as well. Her clothing was all torn, parts of her body were exposed, her breasts, her genitals, just the same way that Ivy's were. Another striking similarity were the marks on her neck. Her autopsy also revealed that this had been her cause of death. She had been strangled to death. And again, although it seemed as though, from the way that her body was left, that she might have been sexually assaulted, the autopsy showed that there was no sign of any kind of rape or sexual assault to her body. So immediately now, police notice the similarities straight away and they are very aware that they have a repeat murderer on their hands. And this person had the potential with just one more kill to become a serial killer. And who knows how many women are gonna lose their lives in this way if they don't catch this man. So the only slight difference between these two murders was that it seemed that Pauline Thompson had been robbed because her bag wasn't found anywhere near her person and she was carrying a bag on the night that she was killed. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that the motive was suddenly robbery. They didn't know if her bag had been robbed or maybe just moved somewhere else. Maybe she dropped it in a struggle or maybe her killer had taken it and ditched it somewhere because they felt that it was too obvious. So police decided to start in this case by getting in touch with Pauline's husband. Obviously, looking back at the last one, they thought, let's talk to the men in the life first. Pauline's husband was actually a policeman and he was ruled out as a suspect very, very quickly because it turned out that he'd actually been on shift on the night of her murder, about an hour away, and like all his co-workers could vouch for that. But from talking to her husband, police learned that Pauline was actually going out with a bunch of friends on the night of her murder. They were all gonna go out dancing. And Pauline also had this little like job on the side where she would sing in bars. So her and her friends would all go out to different bars. Pauline would get up and sing. All her friends would be there supporting her, having drinks, whatever, because she was a really, really talented singer. We'll get into that later on in the video actually, because because there is more on that. Pauline actually worked at the local radio station, so all these women that she was going out dancing with were actually her co-workers, a bunch of female co-workers. And these friends of Pauline's actually told the police in private that Pauline, just like Ivy, had been going out that night with the intention of cheating on her husband. Pauline would also go by her maiden name so that she didn't seem married. She would take her ring off whenever they would go out to bars and she would always flirt, especially with the American men. And they knew that they were going to a particular bar that night because Pauline had actually planned to go on a date with a man, a man that she'd been on a few dates with before in the past. Her friends told police that the last time they actually saw her was when she was in this bar, she was drinking, she was with an American soldier, they were very clearly flirting. And so her friends were like, okay, cool. That's the guy that she's obviously come to go on a date with. And they trusted this guy as well because Pauline had been on multiple dates with him before. They had no reason to be anxious or worried about this guy. But frustratingly enough for the investigation, Pauline never told her friends this guy's name that she was going on a date with, so that wasn't gonna help. Her friends told police that Pauline was very, very popular with the men. I mean, men always wanted to see her and take her out and buy her drinks because like I said, she would go up and sing and she had this most beautiful voice. And the army men especially loved her. Like the American soldiers loved Pauline because they were men in the wartime and they don't get to see pretty ladies often. But anyway, all of that aside, this was quite useful information for police. The fact that she'd last been seen with an American soldier just like Ivy McLeod had. They concluded that they were on the right tracks and this almost serial killer had to be one of the new American soldiers. So this narrowed it down a little bit, <laughs> but like I said, there were so many American soldiers. There must've been like between 20 and 50,000 in Melbourne at this particular moment. So it narrows it down, but it narrows it down to nearly 50,000 people, which is not, you can't call that narrowed down. But police still tried. I mean, this 
this man had murdered two women now. They had to. They had to try, even though the odds were against them. So the method that seemed to make the most sense at this point was the witnesses. Obviously, they had seen this American soldier in the flesh, literally, eye to eye. So this was Harold that had discovered Ivy's body and then all of Pauline's friends. Police took this group of witnesses from camp to camp to camp to have a look at different men different army men, these American soldiers. Hopefully they thought one of them would recognize them, but I mean, the odds of this happening were very, very low because there were so many people for them to try and look at and try and remember this guy in their head and compare him to all the soldiers. It's probably not surprising that this method really didn't yield M many results at all. And besides, all of these witnesses had seen this suspect, the American soldier, in the middle of a brownout, so how were they supposed to remember them? And police didn't get much further with these two murder investigations when Melbourne was hit with yet another, a third murder. This one took place nine days after the last on May 18th. 1942. That morning, a local butcher had been out doing his usual rounds. He would go and deliver meat to loads of different people, mainly the army camps, actually. When around 7 a.m., he was parked up by one of the local camps when he noticed something laying in the grass behind the camp. So he walked over to go and investigate, and there he found the dead body of a woman who was found pretty much in the exact same way as the last two. She had marks around her neck. Her cause of death was later found to be strangulation. But the way that her body had been posed, it was kind of in a similar vein, but it was different. So this woman was laying face down in the mud, whereas the other ones had been face up with their legs up. This woman had her whole bottom half of her clothes ripped away, taken away. And so her whole bottom half was exposed and her legs were slightly spread, but they were kept laid down. There didn't seem to be any signs of a robbery at this third murder, although the victim's personal belongings were found like 50 to 100 yards away from her body. They were kind of scattered about, like her hat, her gloves, her umbrella. Maybe this was due to a struggle that broke out before her murder. Maybe she was killed there and dragged elsewhere. Who knows? Once again, there was no sign of sexual assault or rape or anything on her body, but there was one thing to note that was different to the previous two murders. In her autopsy, it was found that some mud had actually been pushed into her vagina, which I suppose could be considered sexual assault because it is, you know, one of the sexual organs that has had something forcibly put into it. I think her record just said no sign of rape or sexual assault just because there was no sign of like a man putting his body inside her body, if that makes sense. So that's why it was written on her record like that, but I think this does class as sexual assault maybe. In fact, the substance that was put inside of her wasn't actually mud per se, it was kind of more like a yellow tan-ish kind of clay substance. And this same clay substance was found all over this field, so it was clear that it had happened then and there during the murder. But there's no way it happened accidentally, even though this clay was all over. I mean, there's no way that you would accidentally get mud in such a place during a struggle. That was definitely put there. This woman was identified as 40 year old Gladys Hosking. Originally from Perth, she moved to Melbourne to work at the university's chemistry lab as a secretary. Her parents had been very, very worried about her over the last two weeks. They'd been writing to each other and they'd been saying, look, we know about the murders that are happening in Melbourne. They'd read about Ivy's murder, about Pauline's murder, and they were saying to Gladys, be careful. Don't go anywhere by yourself. Don't go anywhere when it's dark. And I mean, the victims were just like Gladys. They were relatively middle-aged women, women in their 30s, 40s. Women that would have just been walking the streets of Melbourne alone, which Gladys often did. She used to walk to and from work. So Gladys wrote back to her parents saying, you know, I'm scared too. I'm trying not to go out when it's late. Whenever I do walk anywhere, I try and walk in a group or me and some of the girls from work will walk each other home. And that's exactly what she'd done on the night of her murder. Her and one of her co-workers had walked home together. But obviously when you live in different houses, you can't both walk each other 
to your door one person is going to get walked to their door but then the other person will have to walk the rest of the way to their house alone and that's exactly what Gladys had done she'd walked her friend safely to her house and then Gladys was walking the short journey between her friend's house and her own when she was attacked and murdered. So from the scene of this crime, police actually finally felt like they might have a good chance at finding the killer this time because this was a muddy field. Well, it was kind of more like clear, like I said. So a lot of footprints were still there. So police called in a special team of forensics people to come in and analyze every single footprint in this field and maybe find the killers. But what police at the crime scene didn't do was tape up the area. And so by the time this team of forensic people came in to study the footprints, people had been walking all over this field all day, all day. So there was absolutely no chance that they were gonna be able to isolate any single footprint and say, yes, this is the killer because people had just been walking everywhere. It's so frustrating. And unfortunately there was like nothing else to go on at this crime scene, this killer, was doing all of this so seamlessly. He was leaving no evidence, no clues. So instead, police had to do what they'd done with the other two murders and they campaigned for any witnesses to come forward, anyone that might have seen or heard anything to come forward and talk to them. And they did get one person. This person said that they'd seen Gladys walking home from work that night. They'd seen her with a man. And the two of them had been walking under the same umbrella. And this witness said that they thought the man was holding the umbrella a little bit weirdly. It was kind of like he was intentionally trying to hide his face with it. So police asked, well, did you manage to get a look at this man's face? Did you notice anything about him? Any of his characteristics? Any of his, you know, anything about his appearance that could stand out? And this witness said they really didn't notice much other than the fact that he was wearing an American soldier's uniform. This had to be the same killer as the previous murders. This killer had to be a serial killer now. And on top of that, police had an even bigger clue because if you remember, I said that this body was found literally just behind one of the American camps in Melbourne. Police have known this whole time that they're looking for an American soldier in relation to these murders. And now they find one of the bodies literally right outside the camp. So, it was pretty obvious that this American soldier must have been in this particular camp. This narrowed it down so much for police. Finally, they actually had a good chance at finding the one American soldier in this whole American soldier haystack. So this camp in front of where Gladys's body was found was called Camp Pell and Australian police wasted absolutely no time getting to work at Camp Pell. The whole thing was put on lockdown. No one was allowed to enter, no one was allowed to leave until every single one of these men in this whole camp had been interviewed. However, this lockdown wouldn't be that effective because let's be honest, these are fully grown men and there was physically nothing stopping them. It wasn't like there was a fence or a wall or a gate. It was literally just police's word. Police were like, hi everyone, don't leave we want to interview everyone. And some people were like, yeah, okay, I'll stay and I'll be interviewed. Other people were like, fat chance, I am leaving, I'm going to the pub. A lot of them did leave, um, but a lot of them were cooperative and they attended the interviews and they did the police lineups and literally anything that police asked because these American soldiers didn't like that this was going on. Obviously it made American soldiers look bad. And it was also affecting their chances with the Australian women because they knew that there was an American soldier out there murdering people, so they were less likely to get chatting to an American man in a bar. So uh, they were willing to do whatever it took to get this man caught so that they could go out and flirt with some girls again. So these interrogations, these interviews, these police lineups with everyone at Camp Pell was going on for days and days and days, and police really didn't feel as though they were getting any closer to identifying a murderer. That was until one of these soldiers actually asked to speak with them. This soldier was named Anthony Gallo and he walked into his superior's office along with the police. He sat everyone down and he said, right, I know who the killer is. He said that the brownout murderer, the brownout strangler was his best friend. And he had spoken with his best friend and 
told him to come forward to the police, told him to give himself in, but his best friend wasn't going to do it. And so Gallo decided that he had to be the hero and he had to go and give his friend in. So police said, why? Why, like, why do you think your friend is the murderer? Give us some reasoning behind this. Don't just say it. And so Gallo told them that this friend had drunkenly confessed to the murders on multiple occasions. In the beginning, Gallo had kind of given his friend the benefit of the doubt and just thought, oh, he's just talking a lot of crap. He's just really drunk. He's just rambling. But as time went on, he kept doing these same confessions every time he got blackout drunk. And so Gallo started thinking there's got to be some truth to this. What if he's actually telling the truth? What if he is the killer? He said that he didn't have any evidence per se that his friend was the killer, just some things that he'd said when he was drunk. And so he said, please look into my friend, just question him, interview him, put him in front of the witnesses, something. So Gallo gave his friend's name to the police and they were gonna look into him and this meeting wrapped up and all of them left the room. And when they did, they were greeted with some huge news. An arrest had finally been made. While all of these men had been talking in this office, while Gallo had been telling them all this stuff about his best friend, police on the outside had found him. Police on the outside had found the killer. It was actually one of the witnesses that had led to this arrest. So like I said, they'd brought in all these people to look at all these different soldiers and it wasn't really going anywhere for the most part. So this one particular witness was looking at a lineup of men and they realized that none of them were the killer. And so they turned to tell the police officer that had brought them there, look, it's none of these men, bring in the next group of men. And as this witness turned, they noticed a group of soldiers walking by. And as their eyes kind of focused in a little bit more, that was when they saw him, the killer, just walking by as if it was nothing. So this witness yelled, it's him, it's him, it's the killer. And so police ran over, they pinned this guy down and they arrested who they believed to be the brownout serial killer. And that is where I'm gonna leave part one. Part two will be out in the next few days, like I said, so make sure you subscribe with notifications on so you don't miss when I upload it. Thanks again to Wild for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you wanna go and get your first deodorant with them, go through the link down below in my description and use the code NEIL at checkout to get 20% off of your first order. I love it, isn't she so cute? Huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below because that would really help me out. If you want to subscribe and see more true crime content like this, you can click this link right here. If you want to subscribe to my second channel, there is a lot more upbeat, happy things going on over there. You can click that button to subscribe. And if you want to watch another true crime video, there'll be a playlist on screen right now for you to jump into. Bye.